What role could nuclear energy play in addressing South Africa's electricity shortfall? Well, my guest today is Mark Nelson, the Managing Director of Radiant Energy Fund, which is a spin-off from Environmental Progress, which is a movement to support industry and nonprofits in appropriately advocating for nuclear power. So Mark, what are the benefits of nuclear energy as opposed to other traditional forms of energy like fossil fuels and newer renewables technologies? It takes less space, it takes less stuff. Both things that don't matter until suddenly they very much matter. Um, on, the, on the side of taking less space, it turns out that the, the biggest environmental impacts of humans on the globe today are arguably not even CO2 emissions themselves, that so this is going to be a problem, but the use, the changing uses of land. And the great thing about nuclear is it uses almost none of it, almost none of it at all. A little, a little plant like Kuberg is going to be hundreds of times less, uh, less space intensive than um, solar and certainly wind. And what that means is a much lower environmental impact. Now, it isn't all about the environment. People have got to live. Uh, everybody's got to eat. So the good thing about nuclear is that the material inputs are almost nothing. The production costs, which in South Africa are are lower for Kuberg than any other way of making energy, um, certainly reliable energy, the, almost all those costs end up going to humans employed in South Africa to do work in South Africa who buy groceries and houses and send their kids to school in South Africa. So in that way, it's kind of extraordinary that you can have this, you can have this technology where by the time Kuberg's a few years down the line from its construction decades ago, it's a South African project. It's true, um, Kuberg can basically last forever. A plant like that can last forever. And there were foreign experts and some foreign manufacturing involved in replacing the steam generators, but really it's uh, almost all the money paid out for the cheapest form of generation in South Africa is going to South Africans. So that's extraordinary. You, you're unlikely to get that with fossil fuels in your country, um, except maybe for coal, but there are, there are major financing problems with coal at the moment. So Mark, you've shown us the benefits of nuclear energy, but what about the risks, particularly nuclear disasters such as Chernobyl may give policymakers pause uh, when considering the nuclear option. What are your thoughts on this? As long as people are afraid of nuclear, especially as long as decision makers and administrators are afraid of nuclear, nuclear will have the risk of causing nuclear fear. Uh, for example, in, in Fukushima, you had a triple nuclear meltdown that didn't cause a single radiation injury, but it didn't matter. The presence of radiation coming out of that plant combined with, with intense and long held nuclear fears led to several thousand deaths from unnecessary evacuations, medically unnecessary, especially closing the, closing the villages and towns. It was not justified scientifically, but it didn't matter because either the administrators themselves were responding to fear or the public in, in fear demanded such a response. Um, so as long as nuclear fear remains, there's going to be, there's going to be the risk of that sort of, um, destructive panic. With Chernobyl, I mean, hell, David, uh, the plant kept operating for 14 years. In fact, it set operation records three years running after 1986, 1987, 1988, 1989, all saw higher electricity generation at Chernobyl compared to the year before. And unlike some plants, the Chernobyl reactors were all really close together. So if you can, if you can blow up a nuclear reactor in the worst disaster, for nuclear ever. And it didn't even stop the janitors from coming in in the evening and the evening shift taking over the from the day shift and the morning shift taking. It's like it was just a work a day power plant, despite being this horrific thing in people's minds. And in fact, the workers were extremely upset when Ukraine took a cash payout from the EU to close to close the plant. It destroyed employment in the region in 2000, when they did this 14 years after they, the workers are saying, Hey, we've got the most upgraded RBMK plant in the world. Why would you shut down us? But that you know, cash was coming and they were paying up cash to shut down Ukraine's own power plant. And I'm telling you, they regret it 
because guess what? They're getting nibbled on by a foreign power. Um, we'll stay out of the politics, but when you're getting invaded, it, it hurts your pride and certainly your, your land area. And they wish they had the energy because that's the, they're the second most nuclear dependent country in the world, David, after France, despite being the home of the most famous and destructive nuclear accident. Why? Because they survive with nuclear. It's not a carbon policy for them. It's survival. Survival. So yeah, there's risk, but um, when the chips are on the table, when the chips are down, countries choose nuclear. It's, the, it's what you do to survive and prosper. So Mark, in South Africa, we a few years ago had vociferous debate around the proposed introduction of a new nuclear facility, which was going to be extraordinarily expensive. And there were a lot of question marks around governance challenges there, potential for corruption. And this seemed to uh, have put off policymakers in the present day from, from pursuing nuclear. Uh, so what would you say, talking generally about developing markets such as ours and South Africa in particular, uh, what are some of the concerns around financing and how can those be overcome? It's a great question. The plain unvarnished truth is that nuclear is a hard group project. Renewables require very little cooperation as long as you can run people off their land and you can and you can you can get somebody else to take the 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 uncertainty risk and lose, the grid loses option value when you get uh, nature based energy on the grid. The public suffers, but that's typically not the concern of the private parties getting the, the contracts. Right. So it's so easy to do renewables because you don't need much cooperation because it's considered virtuous all the governance issues and the corruption issues and the environmental destruction don't matter to banks doesn't matter to environmental groups they just don't it will it will a few years give it it's going to matter but it doesn't today so nuclear looks like an awful burden like oh thousands of people all cooperating keeping good records oh a bunch of money up front instead of painful unknown downside costs in the long run, you know, uncovered liabilities, that sort of thing. Nuclear, because it has to cover its own, it has to take care of its own waste in every way. Um, the upfront costs and the teamwork involved are just immense. Typically a nuclear plant project is a, is a handshake agreement and tons of documentation, but is also a handshake between two state leaders. All of this either depending on your point of view sounds like the worst kind of corruption or it means that for once all these things are thrust into the light and nuclear has to go up front with its governance issues it has to have intense inspection from international bodies the biggest law firms and the biggest engineering firms in the world are directly interfacing and that's hard it sounds a lot easier to do solar but in the end solar will destroy your grid it will destroy your industries and you won't get any solar panel factories out of it, none. And if you did get solar panel factories, those factories would only run if you didn't get too much solar electricity, right? So the, what you have is what sounds like the potential for corruption because it's large, big decision makers are involved, weighty issues of everything from national independence all the way to the deep psychic fear people have about nuclear having come up in a, in a Cold War era with nuclear bombs pointed at each other. It's just, it's hard. It's really hard. But think about it this way. It's hard in the way that setting up good governance is hard. It's hard in the way that running honest bureaucracies is hard. It's hard in the way that developing a super long-term outlook and work ethic is hard. And I'm telling you, if you guys think in South Africa that you're going to get away with getting prosperous peaceful country without doing those things just by avoiding it in nuclear, you have a terrible, terrible lesson coming, I'm afraid. I, I don't want to guess, but I'm just saying, if you think you can avoid governance issues, big state to state agreements, strong leadership, um, international, international oversight, if you think you can avoid all that, but just not doing nuclear, there are any other options other than gas and coal for that stable power. Um, the wind and solar guys will tell you otherwise. They don't care. They will lie to your face. They know it. it's not their problem. It's your problem if you're stuck in Johannesburg. I'm, I'm here in California. 
in, South, in Silicon Valley, the biggest, some of the biggest carbon neutral firms, they proudly talk about carbon neutrality, are buying diesel generators and getting fast track emergency approval through our very environmental and strict California Public Utilities Commission. Why? because they have to survive. And when the chips are down and you bet on wind and solar, you're betting on diesel generators. So I think you have something to ask me probably about distributed energy resources. Could we unpack that term a bit more, distributed energy resources? Uh, give us an understanding for our viewers about uh, what that term means. Sure. Um, distributed energy resources is uh, the trade term and a euphemism in the, in the West. And, specifically in places like California, which is to describe a degeneration to developing world grid standards. Um, but in phrases that sound good for private investors to invest in and sound good for public regulators to ignore the public good and just kind of regress into like, let me put it this way. People in rich countries, um, they just expect electricity, right? They just expect to have it. And I know that it, for me personally, it was quite a big shock when I spent some time in Sierra Leone and it was like, hey guys, uh, we got one hour of electricity today. We're gonna turn on the generator. Um, you better have your phones plugged in or you're gonna miss your window. Or, or when I had to make um, a two mile walk down a, a recently you know, Chinese built highway in order to find a village that had a hut with a little diesel generator or palm oil generator really, and about a hundred different little cell phone holders set up with little bitty plugs all in a, in a reed hut. And you, you put your phone in and you get, so anyway, that's what we are extremely expensively moving towards in California, which is why we had like the, you know, the blackouts last year because distributed any regional resources is a euphemism for losing the properties that we got by inventing the grid. Inventing the grid, what do you mean there? Well, in the early days of electricity, we had this awful problem where inefficient, um, decentralized generators ramped up and down to try to meet local energy needs. And, and even if you connected to somebody else, you're kind of out of sync and it was just a real big mess and electricity was ungodly expensive, incredibly expensive, David. You couldn't dream of using it quite the way we use it now, even with incredible improvements in, in lighting efficiency, for example. We've just grown to expect electricity. So the grid was invented. What is the grid? It's big wires tying together increasingly efficient centralized generation that however it's come up with, state monopoly or you know incredible private entrepreneurship, putting big money into big centralized generation, vertically integrated quasi public private regulated utility things, no matter what, it provides the bedrock for every other aspect of quality of life and private enterprise in your country. And the grid was invented to tie these power plants together, radically reduce the costs. Look, in a world where in the West inflation keeps going like this, a cost of so many things in society keeps going up, electricity has traditionally gone down, sometimes in real terms, since the 50s and 60s. Why? because we have the grid and centralized generation. However you, however you run it with the state bureaucracy, with entre again, the, the thing is getting big power plants, efficiently using capital by running 100% of the time or close to it, and everybody tied together where you have a big plant and you have the wires go to a big population center, and then that provides the revenue and the, and the uh, size efficiency the efficiency of scale needed to go and electrify everyone, which is the true unifier. Honestly, that's the true unifier in any developed country. It's the electricity access. And then some countries have good, better healthcare systems, some have better colleges and stuff, but all of that rides on the grid. When the grid starts breaking apart, society starts breaking apart. That's why in Silicon Valley and some of the most exclusive and brutally expensive places in the world, for people to live, where they are shutting schools because they're running out of children. These companies that have carbon neutrality as a central plank that they sell to all their investors and their board and their customers are getting diesel generators. It, through emergency fast tracking through our regulator because we can't keep the grid reliable anymore. There's just a warning, we might not have enough power. So when people talk about IPPs and all this uh, stuff in South Africa, what they mean is 
devolving the only system that's ever worked to provide cheap electricity to large populations. And maybe it's replaced with something that works, but historically looks like what didn't work for society. So that's what I mean by distributed energy resources, which you may also know by distributed generation. Thank you very much, Mark. I think you've shown us the importance of nuclear energy as part of a country's energy mix and also the dangers of a lack of energy security. That's it from me, David Ansara. Please remember, like this video, subscribe to the channel, and also check out the link in the description below to our 30-day free trial. Until next time, take care.